Well, good morning, GBC. Uh, it is really good to be back with you. Uh, my, me and my family got to take a nice little vacation in Montana to visit our family. And, uh, but it's, it's really good to be back with you. And, and I just want to say out of the gate here that I know this format and what we're doing is not ideal in any sense and no one's pretending that it is. And all of us are longing to be back together again. Um, but we must remember that God is still on his throne. He hasn't been robbed of his sovereignty. And so even in a season like this, we must entrust ourselves to him and truly believe that he is guiding us in this time and he is not wasting this season. And so I just want to encourage you uh, to continue to press into him. And although we want to rush through this time, I know I do just rush through this season. Um, I think there's a lot of good that can still be had in this moment. And so I just want to encourage you uh, to give yourself to God in that. And, and one way that we really need to continue to do that is through our Sunday worship at home. Um, I know uh, if you're anything like me, it's, it's hard to continue to want to gather in the home and do church in this way. It's not ideal, and we have settled into a new normal. But let's be honest, it's not a good new normal. And so to the best that we can, we want to continue just to encourage you um, to participate in all the elements that our leaders are putting together for you to worship with other people in your home. And we need this. We are liturgical people. We are being formed and shaped in our everyday lives. And a lot of that comes through just saturating ourselves in an unhealthy way in news or social media or other conversations we're having and different things that we're just being bombarded with. And these Sundays and these times together are really meant to form us as God's people. And that happens as we are engaging with the call to worship. Um, as we're engaging in corporate prayers, we're, we're spending time praying with each other in our homes. Um, and I hope you uh, would participate as Amy Campbell is leading that uh, this week in, our, in this way. Or as our music leaders are, are leading us in singing together in our homes. And whether or not you like singing, it is so valuable just to worship God and to be formed by these words is what we're doing. We're being discipled. Or even if it's engaging with the kids' videos, um, even if you don't have kids, maybe you would enjoy uh, Bethany's videos. I know, actually, I've really enjoyed them, and they've surprisingly like ministered to me personally. I don't know how many times that we're singing this silly kid song, and I almost you know look over at my wife and I go, "Man, I needed this today," you know. And so, uh, and obviously this time as well. But I just want to encourage you not to to bite this into different chunks and just kind of digest it when you want, but really continue to strive to gather on Sundays with people that you can, and to worship together, uh, longing for the day we can be together again. With that said, I really do want to move now into our time together in God's Word, and we are looking at Luke chapter 5, verses 27 through 39 this morning. So let's read this together, and then, and then let's pray. It says this, After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, Follow me. And leaving everything, he rose and followed him. And Levi made him a great feast in his house. And there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at table with them. And the Pharisees and their scribes grumbled at his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And they said to him, The disciples of John fast often and offer prayers, and, and so do the disciples of the Pharisees, but yours eat and drink. And Jesus said to them, Can you make wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. He also told them a parable. No one tears a piece from a new garment and puts it on an old garment. If he does, he will tear the new, and the piece from the new will not match the old. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the new wine will burst the skins, and it will be spilled, and the skins will be destroyed. But new wine must be put into fresh wineskins, and no one after drinking old wine desires new, for he says, the old is good. Let's pray. Father God, as we come to you in this moment, although we are apart, we are together. God, we are united to you. Lord Jesus, and so God, I, I do pray right now that you would speak to us convincingly, convictingly, in a formative way through your word. God, would we hear your voice and know it better than any other voice in this world? 
And uh, would you fill us with your spirit in such a way that we would follow you in a transformative way? Um, Lord, I do, I do pray that right now uh, that you'd purify our hearts, that the words of our mouth, the meditations of our heart would be pleasing in your sight. God, you are our rock, you are our foundation in the midst of every season, every storm. And you are our redeemer, God. You have come to save us and one day uh, you, will, you will bring us home to our true home. And, and so, God, I do pray that you would speak to us now in this time. In Christ's name, amen. Uh, if you think about it, one of the most intimate spaces... Uh, that you and I share with others in our society is around a table, isn't it? It's around a table. Uh, That's why, I don't know how many years ago now, me and Elizabeth went out and ate on a date at In-N-Out, and uh, we sat down. It was a packed place at In-N-Out Burger, and we get our food, and we sit down at this. There was like one table left, and it was like a table for four, and we sit down, and we start eating. And this other couple, believe it or not, so this is pre-pandemic, obviously, comes over, asks us, hey, there's no other tables left. Can we sit here and eat our, our food? And not wanting to be weird and awkward, we just said, sure, you know. And so these people sit down next to us at our table, but pretending like we're not at the same table. We don't talk to these people. We're just trying to have our own dates, our own conversations. And it was awkward. It was weird. Why? Because that space that we share with those around a table is actually a pretty intimate space. It signifies relationship. That's why this stuff is weird. That's why you don't just go eat with random strangers and say, can I join you, right? We don't do that. And similarly, that's what we see Jesus doing here, and it's raising a bunch of issues. Jesus is sharing a meal. He's sharing a table with people, and it's causing religious people to raise certain questions. And the responses that Jesus gives are very piercing. They might knock the wind out of us in a good way uh, this morning. And so here's what I want us to see that I think our passage is clearly teaching us. And the first is that we see here Jesus' call to anyone who would follow him, right? His call, verses 27 through 29. But then we see spelled out in these questions and responses two other things. Number one, or secondly here, I guess you would say, who you have to be in order to follow Jesus, in order to respond to this call. You have to be a certain person. We see that in verses 30 through 32. And finally, you have to desire something. You have to desire something new. So what you have to desire in order to follow Jesus. So let's look here at this first thing here that we see in our passage. It's Jesus' call, verses 27 through 29. It says this again. After this, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And leaving everything, he arose and followed him. And Levi made him a great feast in his house, and there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at table with them. So notice here, guys, what Jesus is doing. Uh, He is pursuing people, isn't he? This is like what Jesus does. And in his pursuit, he's going to disrupt their lives. Because what's his call? What are the words that drips off his lips? Follow me. Follow me. Follow me. Two simple words from the mouth of Jesus that if you were to hear these words this morning and actually receive them, they would disrupt your life. They would alter your life forever. They really would. The person Jesus calls to follow him here in this story is a tax collector named Levi. In other parts of the gospel accounts, his name is mentioned as Matthew. Uh, So this is Levi Matthew or Matthew Levi. It was really common for people to have multiple names in this culture. You would have like a Hebrew name or a Greek name and maybe even a Roman name. This, ha- this happens a lot when international students come over to the States. You know, and I've, over the years I've met many people like in, living in Corvallis that were from China and I would say, what's your name? And they would say, my name is um, Jerry or something. And you're like, really? Your name's Jerry and you're from China. You know, and they would say, well, my real name is such and such name. And I would say, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I can't pronounce that, so I'll go with Jerry too, right? We have these, a Chinese name and an American name, right? We do this all the time. Same thing here. This is Levi Matthew, Matthew Levi, something like that, okay? And what is this guy's response? What's Levi's response? It says, in leaving everything, he arose and followed him. Luke wants us to know that this man didn't just follow Jesus for a day. Levi didn't follow him for a season, and he didn't just try to sprinkle some Jesus into his life. Right? He left everything. This echoes the response that we saw earlier in this chapter in verse 11, where Simon and James and John, 
They too receive the call from Jesus to follow him and they leave everything we are told and they follow Jesus. And this is actually important because Luke uses the imperfect tense here. Literally, this says Levi begins to follow Jesus. It's a continuous action sort of thing. The call to follow Jesus was not understood by Luke as a call to some sort of half-hearted loyalty or just spending a few hours with Jesus. It involved a complete and continual following of Jesus. And furthermore, guys, let's think about this. What Levi gave up was a lot because tax collectors were very wealthy. Uh, Levi was probably the wealthiest even of all the apostles. We should not miss just the quiet heroism in his response here. If following Jesus had not worked out for the fishermen, who were called earlier in the chapter, if that hadn't worked out, they could just probably return to their trade and, and kind of pick up where they left off. But when Levi walked out of that tax booth on that day, if it didn't work out in following Jesus, they, they would never have re-offered him that kind of position. Right? If you would abandon your tax booth, why would you ever get it back? That kind of thing. His following of Jesus was extremely sacrificial and, and it was a final commitment. Levi left everything he had, his profession, his wealth, his personal identity. He followed Jesus. And notice what he does next, right? Verse 29, what does he do? He invites Jesus to his house and he makes him a feast, right? This would have been expensive. So he invites Jesus into his home and he spends his resources on Jesus, right? He invites him to his table. It, clearly, Levi isn't leaving everything and following Jesus with some spirit of reluctance or in some manner of grumbling, right? He's following Jesus with banners flying high, right? He gathers a large company of guests for this great feast and celebration. So Levi sure seems to find it exhilarating to forsake everything for the purpose of following Jesus, right? And then notice one other thing, though, here that Levi's doing. What's he doing? He's mixing Jesus into his previous life, isn't he? Right? Not only does he bring Jesus into his home, but what's he doing? He's introducing Jesus to all of his friends and family, isn't he? See, following Jesus means more than just wandering on the countryside, you know, listening to Jesus teach and preach and kind of, oh, that was interesting and, oh, I like that bit or that was confusing or I don't know about that. You know, that's not what it means to follow Jesus, not even in this time. See, following means you're using your influence, in Levi's mind, to introduce other people to Jesus. Because Levi leaves the tax table in order to invite people to the dinner table, doesn't he? So following Jesus, he understood, means inviting other people to meet Jesus as well. This is what it looks like to respond to that two, that, that call of Jesus, which is two simple words, follow me. This is what we're seeing here. As J.C. Ryle convincingly and convictingly says, a converted man will not wish to go to heaven alone. Someone who's truly converted will not wish to go to heaven alone. Right, that's what we see Levi doing here. What we are seeing here is the consistent call of Jesus and what it looks like to respond to his call. Yes, this is just one story in scripture, but this story is a pretty standard template of what we see repeated in the gospels. Jesus says to us, follow me, and that looks a certain way, that demands a certain response. You know, I kind of wonder if we've bought into a different idea of what it means to follow Jesus. And because of that, we often find ourselves lifeless and frustrated in our faith. Um, probably one of my favorite things to do in life is to go on dates with my wife. And uh, once in a while, uh, whether it's for a birthday or something, Elizabeth will surprise me with a surprise date or a surprise getaway. And I've learned something, just a little tip. I learned something early on that if someone ever surprises you with a date, you don't begin to wonder what it is that you're going to do. You don't begin to get your hopes up about the sights you're going to see, the places you're going to eat, the places that you're going to go, because if you do and you put your hopes on that, what will happen if that isn't met is you'll be a little bummed out. You'll be a little frustrated, won't you, right? I don't know if this is ever true in your life. But I began just to realize, man, I'm missing the point altogether. If my wife surprises me with a date, I'm just no longer going to like try to dream up what it is that we're going to do and put my hopes in that. I'm just going to begin to think about, man, I, I get to spend the day, I get to spend the weekend with Elizabeth. 
and, and no matter what it is that we do, no matter where we go, no matter the sights we see, the places we eat, I get to be with her. And that's the point. That's the goal. Right? See, when Jesus says to us, follow me, if my heart's desire is to simply be with Jesus, then the expectations kind of go out the window and I begin to open my hands to whatever it is for the sights that I want to see as I follow him or the things that I hope we'll do or whatever things I hope he'll give me in the process. You know, all that stuff goes out the window. But if I have these presupposed expectations of what it looks like to follow Jesus, if I, those aren't being met exactly the way that I want them to, that's going to really frustrate me in my faith. I think many of us are doing this. So this is the call, guys. What? Follow me. And contextually, we see what the response to Jesus' call looks like here from the advice, the, the life of Levi. Okay, so, so how will this ever be true in my life? Does my life resemble this in any way? Right? Does, does your life resemble this in any way? Right? This, is, this is where the turning point takes place. In order to follow Jesus, you have to be a certain kind of person and, and know that you are that person. And secondly, you have to desire something. That's where this conversation heads. Secondly, that you, who you have to be in order to follow Jesus, that you have to be a certain kind of person. Look in verse 30 through 32. It says, And the Pharisees and their scribes grumbled at Jesus' disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So, so think about this. Who religious people go after are the moral, right, and the clean, and, and are not the same people that Jesus goes after. Right? Jesus goes after, hear what? The sick, the sinners, the tax collectors, and his disciples do too. Right? See, religious people separate, don't they? Right? Jesus' people integrate. That's what they do. I think we get hung up here on the idea that tax collectors were viewed as horrible people. I mean, for us, we don't like paying our taxes, but we don't really think of people who work for the IRS as like the worst people or something like that. So what was so bad about Levi? Why, why was it so inappropriate for people like Jesus to be associating with him and to be sharing a table with him? Well, they're living under the Roman Empire. Just think about it. And the Romans were taxing people, even the Jews, by farming out the taxing rights to the highest bidder. So someone like Levi would come along, and if he was the highest bidder, right, he, he was the successful person, well, he would pay Rome the amount that he bid, and then he would go about collecting taxes, and he would collect more than that in order to pay his expenses, and then even more than that so that he could make a profit, right, a legitimate profit. But it was a strong temptation for people like Levi, right, to tax way more than was necessary right? To just pad the pocket a little bit. So this would do what to the Jewish culture or to the Jewish society? It would provoke resentment, especially amongst patriotic Jews who didn't like seeing Jews serving and collecting taxes for a Roman empire that had conquered them, right? So this vicious cycle develops. Imagine this, this vicious cycle. The more people like Levi overtaxed people, the more they were hated. And the more they were hated, the more they would want to overtax. They're like, well, you hate me, right? So this is, a, this is a horrible cycle. The, these people like Levi, they were collaborators and extortioners. They were seen as dishonest. They were seen as robbers, essentially. So what do these religious people do? They criticize the disciples for associating with people like Levi. They ask, why do you eat and drink with those people? And the scribes and the Pharisees, they had very strict rules for ceremonial purity, and it was unthinkable that they would have eaten with people, people like Levi and his friends, because they were bound to probably be ceremonially unclean and there was no sure way of people like that were religious and pious to become defiled than by associating with people who were probably unclean. And again, in this culture, to eat with a man meant friendship by association. Okay, so all that in mind, here's the thing. This, this might sound ridiculous to us, but if we, guys, are not careful we will create barriers between us and other people in order to separate ourselves and in turn make us feel better about ourselves. And that's what these people are doing. And if the barrier that we've created in separating ourselves from people is a barrier that Jesus himself crossed, well, man, then we aren't following Jesus with our perspective, are we? We're just creating our own Bible. It's really what we're doing. 
Now, in typical Jewish teacher fashion, Jesus cites a parable here to emphasize his message. And what's his message? He says, well, wellness does not drive people to the doctor. Illness does, right? He says in clarifying what he means by sickness and wellness, he says, well, I've not come to call the righteous, right? Jesus here isn't saying that some people are righteous and therefore do not need his healing salvation, but that some people falsely think that they are righteous and don't need Jesus. So Jesus says, I didn't come for those who think they're well and don't think they need me, right? I've come to call sinners to repentance. That's what he means by sick, right? I came for the sick, those who are sinners, and they know it. He did not, however, come to leave them in their sin, did he? He didn't just come to eat with them, hang out with them, and say, your life is good as it is. No, he integrates with them in order to call them to repentance, right? He calls them to that. What is repentance? It's leaving everything and following Jesus, isn't it? It's, it's letting Jesus govern your life. It's entrusting your life to Him and His good will and, and way for you, right? Jesus is the spiritual doctor. He's come for the sick, not just to hang out with them, but to heal them. And if we can have the proper perspective in our own lives today, we would realize that this is all of us, isn't it? You, you can live as if you're healthy even though you're sick, but that would be no benefit to you. If you just think you're healthy, but you're actually sick, I mean, ignorance would not be bliss, would it? I mean, just think of that family member, that friend, or that loved one who's really stubborn, maybe, about their health. They'll never go to the doctor. I don't know, maybe this person's actually you. I don't know. Maybe, maybe you're growing in concern over someone's health, and you're like, I really think something might be off. Like, I, I really think you should go see the doctor, and they just continually say to you, no, I'm fine, I'm fine. I'm not going to the doctor. I haven't been in... 40 years or whatever it might be, right? They might actually be very sick, but unless they know that they're sick, right, they will never go to the doctor to be examined and receive the help that they need. That's Jesus' point. The same is true here. If you're sitting here this morning and you're thinking, oh, I'm I'm well, right? I don't need Jesus. Then Jesus is saying, oh, I didn't come for you. I didn't come for you. That's what he's saying. And again, you might know in your head the right answer. And so you sit there and you might even say out loud, well, I know I'm a sinner. I know that I'm like sick, right? Um, but, but really, like, is this something that you know in, inside of your heart, right? And that's good that you can say that. But in your genuine assessment of yourself, what Jesus is talking about is not merely knowing the right answer, like, that's not knowing the right thing to say, to say or the right thing to fill in the blank on the test, right? But it's actually believing that you actually aren't well, that you truly are sick apart from Christ. It's not just saying that you know that you are on paper, but actually believing that you aren't well. I mean, just imagine that you are stubborn and think that you don't need to go to see the doctor, even though all those people around you would say, hey, you need to go to the doctor, you need to see the doctor. You cannot believe that you are sick, right? And, but then still knowingly say, well, I'm not as healthy as I was when I was 25 or when I was 16, right? You know you're not as healthy as you were then, but that's not the point, right? Of course you're not as healthy as you were when you were 35 or 25 or whatever it is. None of us are. But this is the difference between realizing that you aren't perfect and like everything's not working in you know, proper order and, and realizing that you are in desperate need of help. Like, that's what Jesus is talking about. Do you believe that you are in desperate need of Jesus' healing help? Do you believe that? Like, not just know it, but believe it. John Stott says, Nothing keeps people away from Christ more than their inability to see their need of Him and their unwillingness to admit it. Right? To believe in and follow Jesus, to fundamentally see my need for Him. Right? To follow him, I must see my need for him. To believe in Jesus, I must see my need for him. You can't follow Jesus if you look at Jesus and you say to him, oh, I'm okay. I'm all right. I mean, but that person over there, do you see them? And they really, they need you for sure. C.S. Lewis says, Christianity tells people to repent and promises them forgiveness. It has nothing, as far as I know, to say to the people who do not know that they have done anything to repent of, and who not feel that they need any forgiveness, right? 
It kind of makes me think of this uh, pretty eerie song that Sufjan Stevens wrote about 15 years ago. And the title of the song is John Wayne Gacy Jr., which tells a story, the historical story, about the man who in the 70s lived in Illinois, and he killed 33 teenage boys. A really haunting, disgusting, uh, horrible event in the history of our country. And this song, it's beautiful in a way, but you kind of feel weird about it because it's telling you a pretty awful story. And you're just kind of wondering the first time you listen to it, why is he writing a song about this? But at the very end of the song, Sufjan Stevens makes a strange connection that you wouldn't expect him to make. He says this, he says, And in my best behavior, referring to John Wayne Gacy, right? In my best behavior, I'm really just like him. Referring to John Wayne Gacy. Look beneath the floorboards for the secrets that I have hid. Referring to the secrets John Wayne Gacy hid below his four floorboards of his, of his house. All right, how does someone like Sufjan make a connection like that when the whole world universally would look at somebody like John Wayne Gacy and say, now that guy is sick, right? How could he say, well, I'm really just like him, right? Well, it's by realizing that we are all sick and we just have different symptoms, right? The disease we all have is sin. And for some of us, that manifests itself in oppression of actual people. For others, it manifests itself in addiction and abuse. For some, it manifests itself in greed and pride. For some, in just anger or incessant worry or in vanity and, and, you know, fakeness and wanting to control everything maybe, or it's being obsessed with whatever people think about us, what others think about us, or maybe it's in sexual immorality, or maybe it's expressed in just overt hatred of God, or maybe it's just expressed in our self-sufficiency that we actually maybe don't feel like we need God. We can do life on our own and we want to control life on our own. It's depending on whatever your symptom is, you'll view others with a different symptom as sick, but you will justify your own sickness because you're comfortable with it. Because I've really struggled through this passage this week because I've been faced with the reality that I don't have the power to convince you in and of myself. I don't have the power to convince myself even, right? That, that, That apart from Christ, I am sick with my sin. If you've been a Christian for any length of time, it's easy to say, oh, I I know I need Jesus, I know I'm a sinner, but let's be honest, do we really believe that apart from Jesus that we are truly sick, that we really need Him? Do we know how to talk, but if we could really see our heart, we would say to Jesus, oh, I'm, I'm actually well. Here's the thing, if your heart, not your mouth, your heart says, oh, I'm pretty good, I'm well, we must hear Jesus say to us this morning, Oh, I didn't come for you then. Not only have I, do I have to be a certain person, Jesus says, which he says, I I came for the sick. He also says, you have to desire something new. And that's where this passage ends, right? Verses 33 through 39, we see the religious leaders ask a second question. The first question was the religious people ask, why do you eat and drink with those bad people? That was their first question. Jesus gave him this response that, oh, I came for these people. All right, the second question here is simply, why do your disciples eat and drink? That's what he says in verse 33, right? All right, the, the religious leaders point out that the disciples of John and the disciples of Pharisees fast often, but Jesus' disciples don't fast. And the religious leaders wonder why. I mean, isn't fasting what all disciples do? Well, we must first ask here, what was fasting at this point in time? Fasting had become a widespread Jewish practice in these days. Pharisees often fasted twice a week on the second and fifth day of the week, so Monday and Thursdays. For them, fasting meant sacrifice, okay? It was a mournful offering to God in seeking to gain God's attention. And the overall effect of this was to view basically true religion, true piety, as something that was solemn, something that was joyless and gloomy. So when fasting the Pharisees would actually try to look miserable, okay, right, to kind of earn God's attention. This is really different than Christian fasting because Jesus actually tells us, you know, to fast um, now as we wait his second coming. But when Christians fast, we don't do so in order to earn God's favor. We know that, 
right? We do so in order that we might gain greater clarity in our prayer life as we seek the face of God, or fasting often helps us hunger for God and untether ourselves from things in this world to more tightly tether ourselves to God, right? This is what Christian fasting does. But here, this act of fasting was actually to mourn and to try to earn God's attention. And I think knowing that helps us understand Jesus' response. Because again, Jesus speaks up for his disciples in verse 34 and 35. And he essentially says what? My disciples aren't fasting because they are joyfully celebrating that the bridegroom, right, the Messiah is with them. Guys, do you see this? The mere presence of Jesus justifies celebration. Do you see this? Right? This flies in the face of most religion that is usually very serious, usually really downcast. So Jesus says, then one day when I'm taken away, then they will fast as they anticipate my second coming is what he's alluding to, right? But right now I'm with them. And so he likens their current reality to what they're experiencing to a wedding feast. So again, another meal, another table, right? And wedding feasts required in these days, seven days of festivity. And during a wedding feast, during those seven days, you were not allowed to fast, right? You were not allowed to do it, or you were not allowed even to engage in other mournful or difficult things, right? Difficult labor, mournful tasks, that kind of stuff during a wedding feast. And Jesus says, this is what their life is like right now because I am with them. Guys, do you see this? Jesus' disciples are too joyful and, and people are accusing them of it, basically. They're functioning in their lives in a celebratory way. Why? Because Jesus is with them. To drive home this point, Jesus then tells them two parables. He gives them these two pictures. First, you don't put new cloth on an old garment. He says it'll tear and it won't match the old. And secondly, he says, you don't put new wine into old wineskins. It'll tear and it won't hold up. We see these stories in verses 36 through 38, these parables, right? And when Jesus tells these parables, they would have been very familiar to the people who were hearing them, but to us, uh, you know, not so much. So let me help just for a second here. Just think about it. Older clothes had already shrunk, right, from when they were washed. So if the old garment had shrunk and the new cloth had not, by sewing it on the next time it's washed, that cloth would tear, right? It, 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 it needed a brand new garment. It wouldn't work. You can't put the two together, right? You just needed a whole new garment. Okay, Wine, on the other hand, would often be kept in wineskins. Wineskins would maybe be made of goat skins or something like that. Maybe that's gross to you. I don't know. It sounds really gross to me. But naturally, uh, they, would, they would store this new wine in a, an animal skin. And as that wine fermented, it would cause the skin to expand. Okay? So if, if you've already used up that wine, you put new wine in an old wine skin that had already expanded, it would expand as that, as that wine ferments, and then the wine skin would become too thin, and then it would break, right? It, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't work. It wouldn't have the capacity to hold that new wine. You need to put new wine in new wine skins. What's Jesus' point? Okay, verse 39 is really key. Here's the point he's driving home. He says, no one after drinking old wine, desires new, for he says, the old is good. What in the world does that mean? Right? You don't even have to like wine to know that the older the wine, the better. Okay? And that's Jesus' point, kind of. Right? He's saying, if you think what you already have is best, then you won't desire something new. That's what he's saying. Because you say, the old is good. I like my life the way it is. Right? You don't desire the new because you like the old. You like your life the way it is. Isn't that basically what the religious people are griping about? They're saying, Jesus, religious people don't eat and drink with sinners. That's not how we stay clean. That's not how we stay acceptable to God. That's not how modern Judaism works. Jesus, religious people fast. They don't live a joyful, celebratory life. Why would you do that? Right? You don't know if you're acceptable to God, so you need to do certain things to try to earn God's favor. And what's Jesus saying? Oh, that, that's not what I'm here to do. I'm here to do something that's altogether new. And you won't desire the new thing that I'm doing because you say the old is good. I like my life the way it is. Jesus is not simply here to patch up Judaism, you guys. He is bringing something radically new. A man drinking old wine does not even want to try 
new wine, right? He's not even comparing the two, is he, right? He's so content with the old that he does not even consider the new for even a moment. It's the old that's good, right? Why would I try the new? Right? Jesus is saying that this isn't just a new software update that I'm bringing, right? This is a, a whole new phone, right? This is a whole new computer, right? It's not just an update, right? This is a whole new thing that I'm doing. You guys, Jesus has come and he's not here to just be an addition to our lives. That's not what it looks like to follow him. He's not an addition, okay? I love how C.S. Lewis illustrates this in his book, Mere Christianity. He says, imagine yourself as a living house. God comes in to rebuild that house. At first, perhaps you can understand what he's doing. He's getting the drains right, stopping the leaks in the roof and so on. You knew that those jobs needed doing and so you're not surprised. But presently he starts knocking the house about in a way that hurts abominably and does not seem to make any sense. What on earth is he up to? The explanation is that he's building quite a different house from the one you thought of. Throwing out a new wing here, putting an extra floor there, running up towers, making courtyards. You thought you were being made into a decent little cottage, but he's building a palace. He intends to come and live in it himself. That's what he's doing. I'm just wondering, where are you at this morning? Are are you content with wanting Jesus to work within the confines of your expectations? Are you content with the old and you kind of just want Jesus to come in and renovate part of your home, you know, referring to your life? You like the other parts, but you feel like maybe Jesus could do a little work on your half bath or something like that, but really, please don't touch the rest of the house. I kind of like it the way it is, right? To go back to verse 32, you would say to Jesus, oh, I'm pretty well. You know, I'm fine. I'm good. And the old is good. If so, Jesus says, who I am and what I've come to do is incompatible with you. He says, oh, I haven't come for you then. I came for the sick. I came for those who are desiring the new. I've come to make old people new. And that only happens when you don't want the old you desire the new. On our um, recent trip to Montana, we stopped by Shoshone Falls in Twin Falls, Idaho. And I was thinking about this because I was carrying our three-year-old down to the waterfalls. And it's a pretty, it's like a little mini Niagara Falls. There should be an image here on the screen for you to see. Um, and I chose this image because Isla is not looking at the camera. She's actually looking at the waterfalls. And as you get out of the car, you can't even see the falls, but you're already experiencing the mist of the water. And as I'm carrying her down to go see the falls, she goes, oh, daddy, 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 look. And I'm thinking she's going to point to the falls, to which I don't see yet, but maybe I think she does. But no, she's astounded, and she points over to a drainage pipe that's just pouring out a little bit of water. And she's like, daddy, look at that, you know. And I look over, and I look at it, what she's, you know, just staring at and amazed by. And I say, oh, that's cool. But if you think that's cool, you know, turn around. You know, there's like something way cooler, you know, and just think about that for a moment, just thinking about how this one thing is like capturing her attention, you know, it's, that seems good, right? When really, when she turns around and sees the real thing, something altogether new that she had never seen before, that is infinitely greater. And it kind of makes me wonder how many of us are captivated by the old and we say the old is good. It's fine. I like my life the way it is. I'm well, I'm okay, Jesus. And Jesus is like, no, 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 turn around. I've come to call you to repentance. It's something altogether new, something altogether better, something infinitely more. Guys, and that's exactly what we see as you fast forward in the Bibles when you see Jesus at another table. At the end of Luke chapter 22, he's eating and drinking with his disciples and Levi, he's still there with him, isn't he? Remember? Remember what Jesus said at that table? It says, and when the hour came, he reclined at table and the apostles were with him. And he took the cup with wine in it, saying, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Right? The wine Jesus holds up at that meal, Jesus says, is wine that's poured out for you. It's poured out for the sick and those who believe and know that they are sick. It's poured out for those that are done with the old. It's poured out for those who say, the, the, don't say the old is better, but they say, I'm done with the old. I'm ready for the new. 
The cup Jesus is referring to that's poured out is none other than his life. He goes, doesn't he? And he pours out his life in death on the cross. And it's not wine that comes out, is it? No, his very lifeblood is what is spilled. And in pouring out his life, a new covenant is made between God and us. A new life is offered and is had. A covenant that fills us with joy even as we fast, even as we wait Jesus' second coming, even as we wait for that final meal that's talked about in Revelation chapter 19, 9, that says, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Who's invited to that table on that day? It's those who knew they were sick and they went to Jesus as their only hope. If you can come to grips with the sickness of your sin, Guys, what happens is you finally open yourself up to grace and you experience the sweetness of Jesus' grace in a way that will infinitely transform your life. You open yourself up to Jesus' healing of your soul. But until you see that you are sick and until you desire the new over the old, you will never be able to receive Jesus. You will never truly be able to follow him because you'll say, I'm well. And Jesus says, oh, I didn't come for you then. Maybe you don't need to be convinced that you're sick this morning, but you resist coming to Jesus because you find yourself too unworthy. I mean, just hear these gracious words of Jesus this morning. He's saying, you're exactly, you are exactly the person who feels unworthy. You are exactly the person that I came for. You're who I want to share the table with. Let me end with this. Dane Ortland in his new book, gentle and lowly. He's interacting around um, the famous Puritan John Bunyan who wrote an entire book on Jesus' gracious words from the Gospel of John, chapter 6, verse 37, that says, where Jesus says, whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. And he goes through this test, basically, of describing people who resist coming to Jesus because they don't feel worthy. They, they feel too sick. And they don't think they can go to him. And so the person makes these excuses and Jesus gives these responses here. The person says, no, wait, we say, cautiously approaching Jesus. You don't understand, Jesus. I've really messed up in all kinds of ways. And Jesus says, I know. You would say, you know, most of it, sure, certainly more than what others see, but there's perversity down inside of me that's hidden from everyone. Jesus says, I know it all. Well, the thing is, it isn't just my past, it's my present too. Hear Jesus say, I understand but I don't know if I can break free of this anytime soon. Jesus says, that's the only kind of person I'm actually here to help. Well, Jesus, the burden is heavy. It's, it's heavier all the time. Jesus says, then let me carry it. Oh, it's too much to bear. Not for me. You don't get it. My offenses aren't directed towards others. They're against you. Well, then I am the one most suited to forgive them. But the more of the ugliness in me you discover, the sooner you'll get fed up with me. And that's when Jesus says, whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. Jesus comes and he sits at your table this morning. And he says, follow him, follow me. But let's go to him with our sickness. Let's ask him to give us hearts that desire the new. As we hold on to the truth that we know is true. It's a benediction. I wanted to point our eyes towards the newness that we're headed towards that Jesus is leading us towards, even in a moment like this, we must remember that this is true. It says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, a new Jerusalem, coming out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne, saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither there shall be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things, the old things have passed away. And he who is seated on the throne says what? Behold, check this out. Look at this. I am making all things new. Guys, may we be people who desire the newness that Jesus is bringing. And may we run into his healing arms this week. Love you guys. 